All right, boys and girls, back with another video. So what you see in front of the camera right now is not a lie. Yes, I'm finally trying some of the new uh, AMD Ryzen CPUs and platforms. I personally have mostly been an Intel guy since I started this whole hobby, like building custom PCs and overclocking. I have some experience with some of the more older AMD CPUs and platforms like the AMD Phenom CPUs, the very old Semprance and the FX CPUs like the 8150, A350, A370 and the 9590. But I haven't tried any of the new AMD Ryzen CPUs since AMD CPUs became a viable option again since 2017. Not sure why I have been sticking only with Intel stuff but I don't know. The day has finally arrived that I finally test some of these new AMD motherboards and CPUs. I really want to see how my pretty awesome dual rank memories can do on the AM4 socket with the Crosshair 8 Impact because the Crosshair 8 Impact should be one of the best AM4 motherboards for memory overclocking because there aren't that many motherboards for the AM4 socket that only have one memory slot per channel. There aren't that many really. One of the uh, one interesting motherboard would be the MSI B550 Unify X. It's a full ATX design over the mini ITX design of the Crosshair 8 Impact, but it only has two memory slots. So that one would be a very interesting motherboard. So uh, I already have the memory sticks ready over here with the custom heat sinks by Barks. I really want to see how well they can run on this motherboard because on the Z490 Dark Kimpin they were doing 4700 MHz completely stable, like daily stable, like uh, fully tested in AGI memtest and so on, and uh, 4800 plus with the CPU on water cooling. So it will be very interesting to see how that compares to the AM4 socket. So the, I, I actually didn't purchase these parts myself. These were sent to me for test by another member on our Finnish uh, tech media site forum. So the website is called IOTech and the user is uh, Solitan. So huge thanks to Solitan for lending me these parts to test. The uh, worst part about this whole uh, loan is that I'm it took me like two months to actually test these parts because I've been so busy I haven't had time to test these earlier but I'm finally doing it. So I'm actually uh, sending these parts very soon after making this video but let's see how well we can run these parts anyways. So uh, luckily I have the very awesome CPU water block made by Alphacool which has the switchable uh, mounting bracket so you don't, you don't actually have to take the loop apart to switch the mounting bracket for the CPU so that's a very nice thing so we can change between Intel socket and AM4 socket very easily without taking the loop apart so uh, Crosshair 8 Impact it has the X570 chipset so the biggest difference between AM AMD platforms and Intel platforms is that on AMD you don't actually have to get the most expensive chipset. Like for example the new uh, motherboard from MSI, the MSI B550 Unify X. It has the uh, a little bit lower end B550 chipset instead of the uh, flagship X570 chipset. So that's one of the biggest differences to my eye between AMD and Intel because on Intel platforms we always have to purchase the motherboards with the most expensive chipset like Z370, Z390, Z490, X299 and so on. The lower end motherboards with the more lower end chipsets they really they pretty much suck. They don't have the overclocking capabilities of the uh, flagship chipset motherboards and uh, all of the most important features. So that's why we aren't really interested in, in, in those. The lower end chipsets, they are mainly meant for like OEM machines and completely stock desktop builds. But anyways, so let's go through this motherboard very quickly and uh, check the parts out and then put the motherboard and the CPU on my test bench and let's see how we can actually overclock these uh, parts. So this is the first time I'm trying 
any of these Ryzen CPUs, so I have zero experience when it comes to Ryzen overclocking. So it will be very interesting to see. I have to proceed very, very carefully so that I don't cause any harm to these parts because they aren't mine effectively. So uh, yeah, main difference is the uh, Mini ITX design. I think this is a little bit larger than Mini ITX, so it's a little bit like uh, longer. It has PCI Express 4.0 over the Intel 3.0, but that doesn't matter at all. If you watched my uh, 3D Mark Paul Royal record score run with the RTX 3090, it already proves that PCI Express 4.0 means nothing at the time of making this video. It doesn't give you any performance gain over the uh, restricted 3.0 on the Intel platform. Mainstream Intel is still the fastest platform in many uh, 3D workloads, like Paul Royal, for example, or many, on, on many uh, uh, 3D benchmarks, for example. So that kind of proves that the PCI Express bandwidth is not a limiting factor at the moment. So let's open up this box. So and here's the motherboard. The CPU that's inside the uh, that's in the socket is the six-core model of the latest Ryzen generation. So it's the 5600X. It's effectively the fastest six-core CPU out there in the world at the moment. So uh, not sure if uh, Soliton would let me run it on LN2 if the CPU appeared to be very strong on water, because I think he has a lot of use for these parts. So yes, it's a little bit longer. So the standard, I think the standard mini ITX size would end up here. So it's a little bit longer than the most standard mini ITX motherboards, but it's a very small one anyway. So single eight pin power connector because there's no room. So let's actually put that to the table right now and go through the main features quickly. Okay, so I, I think there's no need to go through all of the accessories. So it's quite basic. I think many of you have already watched many unboxing videos of this particular motherboard model, so there's no need. But yeah, 5600X CPU, I think it's a very nice CPU model. The 8-core model might be destroyed soon by the new Intel. Is it 11700K? Not sure, but yeah. So uh, the biggest highlight about this whole motherboard model will be the memory overclocking because of the single slot per channel design. The VRM on this motherboard is definitely weaker than uh, on uh, the uh, Dark Hero, for example, because the footprint on this motherboard is just so tiny because it's a Media IDX motherboard, so there's no room to make the VRM more powerful than this. So that's kind of obvious. Then uh, just want to see are there any like interesting buttons. So we have a slow mode switch for LN2. That's probably an LN2 mode to, uh, because it's quite likely that the slow mode switch doesn't work if the uh, LN2 mode jumper is not enabled. I would bet that's an LN2. Yeah, there's LN2 mode text over there. So that's an LN, that has to be LN2 mode. We have a safe boot button and a retry button over here. Start button and we should have a reset button somewhere. So those are the main specs, I guess. So let's just move. Let's just remove the uh, mounting plates. I think these are only used for the stock uh, heating coolers and some of the more basic like air coolers. We will be using custom water cooling. So I will remove these or unscrew these and let's mount this whole thing on my test bench and let's see how we can actually run this whole thing. Okay, and that's how the test setup actually looks like. So we have the Crosshair 8 Impact now set up on this uh, test bench. We have the AMD 5600X CPU in the socket with uh, Alphacool Ice Block XPX CPU water block, uh, Galax or KFA2 710 GT graphics card, and uh, yeah, 2 times 16 gigabytes of G Skill Ripjaws 5 4266 Cas 17 memory sticks. So dual rank Samsung B Dimems and Superflower 2000 watt power supply. Now a huge minus thing or a huge minus part about this uh, CPU water block is the mounting. So the mounting system on the AlphaCore water block is much worse than the EK mounting system. So when I uh, well I had to use the original uh, mounting kit that came with this uh, uh, water block for the first time because I don't have the AM4 backplate for the EK mounting. So uh, the uh, Alpha Cool mounting actually uses the stock backplate 
of the motherboard and the water block easily moves a lot when you tighten the uh, mounting screws so it's the same the uh, now and i have to correct myself the crosshair 8 impact is not a mini itx motherboard it's a mini ttx motherboard so it's like three centimeters longer than mini itx so it can fit let's say a second pc express slot on top of the full length x16 one like x1 or x4 slot but uh, it's pretty much the same thing as mini itx motherboard the uh, debug led is on the rear io which we already checked and the reset button on this motherboard is uh, it's qu exactly quite funny so it's next to the debug led over here at the rear io uh, some minus parts about this motherboard is the lack of ps2 combo port at the rear io so i had to use so i had to use ps2 uh, to usb uh, adapter but uh, it does work but if native ps2 uh, port would be better and yeah that's pretty much it so uh, now i just booted the system i will flash the latest BIOS. you can use either the easy flash utility inside the BIOS or the BIOS flashback and then i need to install the actual uh, operating system you cannot mix different uh, operating systems so you cannot mix intel and amd operating system so if you have installed let's say windows 10 with intel platform like x299 or z490 system you cannot boot that same operating system with uh, an amd pc so just saying so we have to reinstall the operating system which we want to use so i will just install windows 10 and we can do basic tests in that one and see how we can actually overclock the cpu and memory and and that's pretty much it i guess so uh, now from here i will just get on uh, installing the windows 10 and i will get back to you once we actually uh, uh, update the bios and go through the bios settings and so on with the capture card okay and now that the bios has been updated to 3204 we can enter the bios by pressing f1 and not sure if they actually have uh, any uh, included profiles probably not so uh, we have to proceed with caution as i've never done this before so uh, i'm technically overclocking a platform i've never touched when i tested it briefly on uh, at stock i mean it was uh, boosting up to like 4.5 4.6 gigahertz something like this so we can use it as a guide so manual we can put let's say let's put 4400 f this is the hard one which i heard of so uh, getting f clock very high is apparently quite tough so you would have very good performance if you got the f clock two gigahertz or above so i think we can put let's say 1600 need to check later so 4.6 let's put 4.6.5 what the heck is this ah uh, some cinebench r15 gentle aggressive okay and we leave that auto dram Twenty-eight. Where's common rate? What common rate two? Die sense. Manual. I think that can be set to extreme, optimized or ex extreme. Manual.
we I need to check this online that what the heck is this uh, voltage and uh, we were setting 4400 so I will put 1.4 volts these are probably meant for LN2 I, I bet and dial in just the stock values on those and I need to ignore the CPU fan thingy so I will F10 save and exit and try to run these settings if I fail I just need to check online that what I'm doing wrong because I have no idea about some of these settings I'm I don't have experience with the F clock thingy it might fail so let's see okay so I had to drop the F clock down a little bit for starters now and also the memory so the F clock is at 1400 and memory 4266 with stop timings pretty much so just test the CPU first so we have 46.5 4650 megahertz at 1.3 volts oh so this is very interesting why are the mems at command rate one but at weird settings so that's probably the issue the sad thing about AMD Ryzen is the lack of per core temperature measurement so we are already at like 70 it's actually pretty warm I don't trust the contact like fully because it move the CPU water block easily moves a lot when uh, when uh, mounting the water block so I'll go back to the BIOS and have to check these memories okay so the issue is definitely on the memory so uh, F clock can go uh, higher easily like 1500 I uh, probably 1600 plus but uh, the memory for some weird reason always sets to common rate one even though I set it to common rate two so at the moment I cannot post higher than 4266 so let's just try the CPU first let's delete that one and open R15 can you use R15 it doesn't matter if you use R20 R23 so 4650 that power temperature that power measurement cannot cannot be correct or at least I would feel so let's just let that let that to pass and then let's raise the uh, multiplier turbo okay so let's put 4.7 I think we can put 4.7 what the heck it did set it so 4.7 there's definitely some droop so I need to increase the load line calibration it's set at die sense not socket sense Two thousand twenty-eight, four seven fifty, running easily. I think sixty-eight degrees on the uh, CPU temperature measurement. Two thousand thirty-two. Weird. It doesn't really increase the score. I mean, that much compared to Intel CPUs. So it feels like there's something limiting the action. Put four eight. Huh. The heck. Still, it's set the. One point two eight eight volts. Two thousand and seventy-eight. 
We have no damn, no damn idea why it's giving me that error. Okay, so that was quite interesting. So uh, I think the CPU is quite good. So we are already at 4.9 gigahertz. I'm not sure if there are 5 gigahertz water AMD Ryzen Wormer CPUs. So it did crash. Oh, when it comes to CPU overclocking now, the maximum speed this can do on water is somewhere around like 4875. I'm not sure if the contact is uh, like uh, the absolute best, but 4.9 is a no-go, even at like 1.43 volts. 4875 currently at 1.38 volts set roughly. The score is quite weird, it jumps all over the place. So, uh, let 1.39 or 1.385 set 4875 and if I set to 1 to 4.9 it will fail I can show that to you now so 49 it did set it so 49 but it will fail Seventy degrees, seventy-one. I'm not really sure if the temperature measurement is correct. Oh, it did pass, so it's a very weird thing. Really don't know what's going on with this setup because this motherboard really seems weird when it comes to memory overclocking. It sets different values I want to set. I want to get command rate two. It always sets command rate one. I don't know why. So uh, I really don't know. In that regard, I don't like this motherboard and platform at all. But it passed for some reason. Four nine. Let's put 4925. This is not going to pass. That's absolute certainty. So, so 4920 something. It will fail instantly. Trust me. Yep. Okay. And a while later. So uh, my first impressions with the uh, new newest AMD Ryzen CPUs and this whole platform is that it's a little bit harder to overclock than the newest mainstream Intel platforms. So especially the memory is a lot harder to get very high compared to uh, Z490, for example. So uh, there are some uh, things that are better on the AMD platform compared to Intel, but my overall experience was that the AMD is quite a bit harder. For example, the uh, dropping of the internal uh, memory clock speed once you go beyond 3600 megahertz. So it's uh, one on one with the real memory frequency until like 3600 and it then drops to one to two ratio once you go beyond 3600. But even after that, I seem to have better performance with very high memory frequency. If, uh, even when the memory con even when the memory controller frequency is only at 50% of the memory frequency. So here is an example score made at 4333 with command rate 1. And remember, these are 2 times 16 gigabyte sticks. So dual rank memories, 16, 16, 16, 28, command rate 1. And memory score 9414. So the, there's a big difference compared to Intel platform is that on, over here on the AMD, you can actually run command rate 1. And it took me a while to realize that to get common rate 2 running, you need to disable the gear down mode. But the funny thing is that I cannot go any higher on the memory frequency, even if I enable common rate 2. So uh, the AMD, the latest Ryzen platform, isn't very tuned for dual rank memory kits. So uh, it's about at the same level as Z390, for example. So uh, Z490 is definitely ahead when it comes to uh, overclocking uh, dual rank memories at the moment so uh, i think i just have to try with single rank memories after this but yeah so uh, 
when it comes to CPU, the maximum speed I was able to pass in Geekbench 3 was 4825. I'm not fully sure is the uh, uh, contact on the cooling solution the best possible because the temperature went already up to 77 degrees and the voltage is 1.385 set with uh, highest low line calibration setting uh, with CPU uh, die sense measurement. And the maximum speed I was able to do in Cinebench R15 was 4.9, 4.9 spot on. So it's not like a golden CPU, but it's not like very bad either. That's my feeling with the CPU right now. And okay, when it comes to single rank, Samsung BDI memory overclocking, 4733 multiplier seems to be the highest one I can get stable or which I'm able to even post and boot. So 4800 and 4266, I mean 4866, 49. Free, free. They don't even post. They give the same F9 debug code when I try to post and boot them. So 4, 4733 seems to be pretty much good. So currently running it with 18, 18, 18, 28 common rate 1 timings. CAS 17 is a no-go so it doesn't even post. So uh, I think these could be stable if I try to run HUIMM test. But uh, in any case it's possible to get this frequency like completely daily stable I'm absolutely certain so now as the last thing as we already tested the CPU 49 max in Cinebench R15 I think we could try uh, low latency memory overclock so I will just limit the maximum memory of the operating system down to uh, down to 4 gigabytes and we can try the same frequency with 14, 13, 13 timings just out of interest. So 4000 and let's go back to the bars. Okay, so the last part about this whole uh, testing with the Ryzen 5 5600X and the Crosshair 8 Impact is, the, uh, is figuring out how high memory frequencies can I run with my single rank Samsung BDI based memories by running the very common A2 PCB low latency profile for these memories. So uh, with 14, 13, 13 timings. And that's maybe the biggest downside of this whole uh, experiment, as I cannot go any higher on the memory frequency than 45, 33. And even at this frequency, it often fails to post. I get a very weird debug code of 01 or 01 on the motherboard's QLED display. And if I try any higher than this, let's say 4600, 4666 or so on, uh, it only gives that 01 debug code or it goes to the BIOS failed or BIOS has corrupted recovery thingy. I asked uh, about this issue from Buildsoid and he thinks it's the motherboard as he has many Ryzen CPUs and motherboards and pretty much all of his CPUs can do at least 4800 on the memory. But some, some of the motherboards can actually fail to do that. So it's very likely that it's this specific crosshair 8 impact that cannot do this uh, or any higher memory frequency than this. So it's a little bit sad as these memories are tested upwards of 4900 plus on air cooling on the Z490 Dark Kim pin. The only, let's say, positive part about this whole experiment has been that the, the AMD CPUs can easily run common rate 1 with various uh, memories, even with the dual rank memory. So that's a that's a good part about this whole experience uh, about this whole experience with the uh, Ryzen and the Crosshair 8 impact. But yeah, so this is the maximum I was able to do 4533 with these uh, timings, memory score of 9445. And you can see the uh, voltages and more of the timings on the Zen timings I, uh, box over here. I didn't manually set most of the uh, memory timings so uh, uh, most of them are left at auto and but one thing of note is the F clock so the F clock went actually quite high on uh, this particular CPU and motherboard so I was able to run 2033 pretty happily so it, it was fully stable in this test and so on and even 2066 was sometimes able to post and boot but when I ran the Geekbench 3 test the score just went worse so uh, the maximum, let's say, uh, fully stable was 2033. But I think any result over 2000 is a very good 
one on these CPUs and motherboards or on uh, AO water cooling. But yeah, so uh, that's pretty much it, I guess. So uh, I think from here we can just move on to the conclusion about this uh, uh, first overclocking test and impressions with the uh, modern Ryzen CPUs and motherboards. Okay, I think that's pretty much it when it comes to my first impressions and first overclocking tests with the new AMD Ryzen CPUs and the whole AM4 platform in general. So the AMD Ryzen CPUs have a lot of good things in them. First of all, they actually made a change in the desktop CPU market. So if we go back to let's say 2016 or 2015, Intel pretty much had a monopoly in the desktop CPU market. So Intel could pretty much make the maximum profits with, with uh, very minimal efforts or next to no efforts at all. And when the first Ryzen CPUs came out in the spring of 2017, it actually took some customers away or many customers away from the Intel products and it forced Intel to actually look in the mirror and forced them to actually try to improve the CPUs properly for a very long time. And it made the overall CPU prices to come down by a lot, especially the workstation models. And now we have various different uh, call count options available, both on the mainstream as well as on the enthusiast or a workstation platforms. So that's a very nice thing. I think the overall situation is kind of good at the moment. We have so good CPUs available that we don't actually even need overclocking nowadays. And uh, we have higher core counts available than what we actually need. That's pretty much it, I think. So uh, the AMD Ryzen CPUs, they have pretty nice performance, especially in uh, multi-threaded tests or multi-threaded workloads. In uh, some single core or single threaded workloads, the mainstream Intel CPUs can actually be a little bit better still, but uh, the difference is kind of minimal. And in some cases, the AMD is actually faster, but it also depends on the clock speed. So uh, maybe the only minus part about this whole uh, platform and this CPU, what I experienced was the, uh, uh, pre uh, was the relatively bad memory overclock what I was able to achieve. So I was expecting much higher memory frequencies, both with the dual rank as well as with the single rank memories, as I've seen many guys being able to run very, very high memory frequencies on this particular uh, platform. So as I couldn't go above like 4266 to 4333 with the dual rank memories and 4500 to 4700 with the single rank, single rank memories, that's a quite a bit behind the Z490 platform, for example. So uh, if the uh, frequencies were higher, then it would be much better because once you go beyond the 3600 megahertz barrier, the uh, internal memory controller ratio drops from one on one to one to two, so to 50%. So in order to uh, overcome that drop, you need a very high or significantly higher memory frequency. So if you want to use the 1 to 2 ratio, you should be approaching the 5 gigahertz frequencies on the memory, like let's say 4700 to 4700 plus with dual rank memories. That would be definitely a very nice configuration. And my particular sticks have been tested multiple times for 4700 to 4700 to 4800 plus on the Z 490 Dark Kimpin, so they are definitely capable. So it's either on the motherboard or on the IMC of this particular CPU that why I wasn't able to achieve that level. We have to understand that the Crosshair 8 Impact isn't a very like new motherboard model. I think it came out already in uh, the summer of 2019, so it's not even released for the Ryzen 5000 series CPUs. Of course, it works just fine, you just need a BIOS update. Uh, as AMD is very uh, recognized or from value perspective as you can use the very same motherboard for over and over again with newer CPU models with just a BIOS update. With the Intel platforms, you have to constantly upgrade the motherboard. So that adds a huge extra cost if you want to upgrade just the CPU. And when it comes to, let's say, temp temperature measurement, it would be very nice if we actually had, a, had an access to the uh, temperature measurement of individual cores. Now we have just single temperature measurement from the CPU. And if I'm correct, it's the temperature of the hardest core or the package temperature. So uh, if we had 
temperature measurement from each of the available cores, that would be a very nice thing, as that has been available on the Intel CPUs for pretty much forever, I think. So uh, I think that's pretty much it. Now, uh, what would I or which one would I recommend? The uh, Ryzen or the latest mainstream from Intel? I think that's all up to you or what you want to do. The AMD Ryzen platform is definitely, or at least I think it's harder to overclock. From the value perspective, the Ryzen is better. You can get better uh, multi-threaded performance with lower cost on the Ryzen. For overclocking, I like the Intel platform more. It's at least what I've heard from other guys, the AMD, the latest AMD platforms are very hard to overclock, especially on LN2. Both the standard Ryzen CPUs as well as the Threadripper CPUs. So these aren't the same thing as the old AMD Phenom 2 or the AMD FX CPUs that you could just go to the maximum temperature of LN2 without any temperature measurement at all, like no issues at all. So uh, these are far from that. So uh, with many of these CPUs, you cannot even hit the maximum temperature of LN2. So for overclocking, the Intel might be at least a more convenient platform to use. And as we have the new uh, Rocket Lake CPUs coming out with the Z590 motherboards, it's very hard to say what, which one will be better because the Z590 will have the same, uh, many of the same features that are already present over here, like the PC Express 4.0, although it's not absolutely required at the time of making this video. So for example, when I tested the RTX 3090 Kim pin in Paul Royal on LN2, I could see a visible difference in performance between uh, PC Express 3.0 X8 and X16. So uh, you will see a performance drop if the PC Express bandwidth drops from 3.0 x16 to x8 3.0. PC Express 4.0 x8 is the same thing as PC Express 3.0 x16. So uh, it's very likely that we are going to need the extra bandwidth of the PC Express 4.0 x16 very very soon with the highest end graphics card options that will come out later. So that's just saying, but with the current cards, it's not absolutely required. You, so you will not get any like clear performance advantage if you have PC Express 4.0 x16. So just saying. <sighs> now, uh, when it comes to memory, I, I'm not fully sure that what is the actual performance advantage or advantage for overclocking uh, from uh, single slot per channel design on these motherboards on the AMD platform compared to the standard four slot or two slots per channel design. There are a lot of good results made with let's say the Crosshair 8 Impact as well as with this more standard is it Crosshair 8 uh, Dark Hero motherboard or some of the boards from Gigabyte and so on. But I think the most interesting motherboard next to this one over here would be the MSI B550 Unify X. It's a full ATX motherboard with just two memory slots, like on the Crosshair 8 Impact. For my use, I would prefer a full ATX form factor a lot more, as I mainly use that very large test bench. So the Mini ITX or the Mini DTX form factor looks kind of weird in a huge test bench. But if you are building a very small form factor build, then of course a motherboard like this is a very nice one or a very good choice. But yeah, I think those are my first impressions. So uh, if you like to see an Intel fanboy trying AMD Ryzen CPUs and motherboards for the first time, and especially if you wanted to see uh, me to, uh, try my uh, dual rank G-Skill Ripjaws 5 memory sticks on the AMD Ryzen platform, then please give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. And yeah, Thanks for watching one of my videos once again, and I will see you on the next one.